Hello and welcome to the Comic Cave. I'm Ramsey, aka Captain Away, and today we're looking at the 2010 series Marvel Zombies 5 The Cinco. By the time MZ5 came about, Marvel Zombies had been kind of done to death. By this point, they had appeared in Ultimate Fantastic Four, their own self titled series, a direct sequel, a direct prequel, an indirect sequel spin off series, two more sort of sequels, a tie in to Black Panther, a crossover with Marvel Apes, and even a crossover with freaking Army of Darkness. As in the Sam Raimi directed Evil Dead series movie, Army of Darkness. I'm not covering that series though, sorry. It just isn't something I can really do right now. Writer Fred Van Linty had been leading the series for a good portion of that, through Marvel Zombies 3, 4, and Returns, and by this point everyone may have been a little burned out on the concept, especially with how lackluster series 3 and 4 were, and the total dumpster fire that is Returns. Seriously, that series sucks, and that's no joke. But yes, I will be covering that one anyway. Sigh. So maybe it's no surprise that Van Linty wanted to try something pretty different with MZ5, and for the first time he got five issues to do that with. Well, unless you count returns, but he only wrote two of those issues, so I don't. So was FVL able to turn the series around with his new direction for outing number five? Well, let's find out and take this away. The comic opens on a graveyard. Oh, I'm sorry, a cemetery. Cause you know, zombies. An emergency message plays over the panels from Armor, the secret agency protecting the normal Marvel Universe from other dimensional threats, whose acronym I have steadfastly refused to say. It's right here, if you care. The message is warning of a thing called a plane storm, which is apparently permutations of highly unusual incidents occurring across multiple realities at the same time. In this case, that's incidents of MZ, which apparently stands for Mass Post-Human Population Conversion, and totally not just a meta reference to the series name. Of course not. No one would do that. This whole thing is probably a reference to Night of the Living Dead, but instead of finding ourselves in a 1950s or 60s world, we find ourselves in the Wild West, where we meet Arno Stark, probably intended to be an ancestor of Tony Stark, and Jakali Kane, though she goes by Jackie. Jackie is the daughter of a character called Hurricane from some old Marvel Western comics, back in ye olden days when comics had more than one genre. Can you imagine? Jackie has brought Stark to town to meet her pops, in the hopes that Daddy Kane will take Arno up on his offer to join his Wild West show. A Marvel equivalent to Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, I guess. Because Hurricane used to be the fastest gun in the West. Maybe even the one responsible for killing Kid Colt. Another old Marvel Western character whose body we saw on display outside the local pharmacy. So you could get your picture taken with a real live dead outlaw. That counted as entertainment in them old west days. Papa Kane is none too happy about the offer though, even belting Arno Stark and telling him to go on back to the big city. Stark is happy to comply, but doesn't get far before Kid Colt pulls him into an alleyway and eats him alive. That's right, the dead have risen. In true Romero fashion, the meteor at the beginning seems to have caused the dead to rise and roam the earth as zombies, and it's not long before they've overrun the town. Which mostly just means killing the women of the local temperance movement, who were introduced earlier specifically to be zombie fodder. They were clearly intended to be unlikable old hags that we wouldn't feel bad about seeing get killed especially with the way their protest was blocking the entrance to the bar that Jackie runs, and the way they look down on her Native American heritage as making her a savage. But I have to say, it's really weird for me to see women of a temperance movement be villainized like this. Maybe modern audiences look back at the movement as hopelessly naive and ridiculous, and just assume that the people behind it must have been crazy. And sure, I'm sure there were some very racist white women who were part of the movement. But quite honestly, the temperance movement was responsible for a lot of early feminism, and it's possibly a major factor in how so many fights for civil rights were able to come about in the 1900s. 
So, obviously, it's so awesome that we get to see a male writer reduce them right back to what men probably spent a lot of time, money, and effort trying to paint them as at the time. A bunch of crazy old women with too much time on their hands who thought they were better than everyone else. Progress. Yay. Yay. One woman from the temperance group does manage to convince Hurricane to put down his own drinking problem long enough to return to his superheroing ways. And he gears up to confront the zombies, who consist of a number of other characters that had appeared in Marvel Western comics. Though the only one I personally find notable is the Phantom Rider, who would basically come to be seen as the Old West version of Ghost Rider. But not the one we saw in Trail of Tears. Definitely not that one. Hurricane shows off his drawing skills on the zombies, proving he really did have the power. And that power is mostly just a super speed ability akin to the mutant Quicksilver. Hence, Hurricane's outfit. But while he can kill most of the zombies, he's halted when he realizes Little Cloud is one of those zombies. She was his wife, or Jackie's mom, and upon seeing her, he finally reveals the truth to Jackie about what happened to Little Cloud. It seems Little Cloud died because Hurricane shot her right in the head. It seems his ability doesn't extend to aiming well, he's just so fast he doesn't really need to aim well. But his ability also required conflict for him to call on it. When Little Cloud had at one point convinced him to attempt to use his skills for profit, something along the lines of what Arno Stark was trying to get him to do just a minute ago, he discovered that he was a useless shot when he shot poor Little Cloud right in the head during an attempted trick shot. He then spent years lying to his daughter, telling her that her mom died of a disease, and drinking himself into a stupor instead of trying to find some other way of making use of himself or attempting to be a good father in any way whatsoever. But yeah, no, definitely it's the women who despise drunks that are the bad guys of this story. Hurricane's hesitation cost him his life, but before the zombies can devour him whole, he passes on his skills to Jackie. Jackie quickly finishes what her father started, even sadly being forced to finish off both of her zombified parents. But she's unable to kill the zombie of an outlaw named Iron Mask, because his mask makes it impossible to shoot him in the head. Luckily, Jackie is saved by a circular saw. Oh, and I guess that circular saw is attached to Aaron Stack, the Machine Man. He's back! Yay! Machine Man explains that he's from another universe, but Jackie is weirdly disbelieving of his claims. Know a lot of people with circular saws for hands, do ya, Jackie? She's a lot more believing when we meet Aaron's companion, one Howard T. Duck. The T stands for B. I love Howard's joke here, asking if they look like they're from Cleveland. It's a nice little nod to Howard's original series being set in Cleveland. But even better than that is the joke he makes when Jackie exclaims her surprise about him being a duck wearing pants. And Howard replies that his lawyers tell him that he's always been wearing those pants. For those not giant Howard the Duck nerds like yours truly, yes, as a matter of fact, I have watched the movie and yeah, I, I kinda liked it. Back when Howard was first introduced, he in fact did not wear pants. Disney, somewhat ironically, warned Marvel that Howard was treading awfully close to copyright infringement of Donald Duck. And to address this issue, Marvel released a Howard the Duck strip where an angry mob, finding his pantlessness to be obscene, forced Howard to Sydneyland. An anagram of Disney, you get it. Where he tried on various outfits to update his look, including dressing up briefly as recognizable Disney characters, just in case you weren't following along, before settling on permanently adding pants to his wardrobe. As I said in my MZ3 review, as much shit as I give Van Linty, he is clearly a fellow Steve Gerber fan. And I appreciate that at no point more than I do with this joke, which literally had me laughing out loud. But anyway, back to the story, what's actually going on here? Well, it seems that Morbius has decided that he can create a cure for the zombie virus, despite how poorly his vaccine worked in the previous series. But in order to do so, he needs samples from zombies from multiple universes, including the zombies they've already encountered, as well as those from five more universes. So Howard grabs Aaron Stack, who was lost in a drunken stupor after sexy robot lady Jocasta, decided to get back together with Ultron 
during a Mighty Avengers storyline. Together, the unlikely pair seek out these zombies, each one named for a specific director whose movie the type of zombie appeared in. So first up, as I've kind of hinted at, was the Romero, who we just met named for George A. Romero, obviously, and hence the Night of the Living Dead references. Next up, the pair, joined by Jackie, head off to find the Boyle-type zombie, named for the not-quite-zombies in 28 Days Later from director Danny Boyle. These zombies apparently reside on a then-future Earth of 2020, where the Martians of H.G. Wells's War of the Worlds were not fictional, which kind of defeats the point of that book because it was really just an allegorical criticism of British colonialism, but for once, that's not Van Linty's fault. This world is from another Marvel Comics series, from stories mostly focused on this guy, Kill Raven. On this Earth, the Martians have herded human beings into factory farms, where they are either food, breeders for the next generation of delicacies, or converted into warriors that fight for the Martians' amusement. Hmm, okay. Maybe this is still allegorical criticism. Once Killraven learns of the group's mission, and of Eren's depression over Chicasta, he convinces the manic depressive robot to sacrifice himself to the Martians. Because once he does, and his capturers dismantle him, the zombie sample Eren kept from the previous world is found and then quote unquote, accidentally, released on this new world in one of the factory farms, creating a whole new world of zombies. Two problems with that. First, that means that these should still just be Romero zombies because it's literally the same infection. They literally used the zombie virus from the previous world to create this zombie. Why does this count as a new zombie? Second, how did they know to come to this world for a zombie sample if the zombies not only didn't exist in this world yet, but also wouldn't have existed if they hadn't come here? How does that make any sense? And yet, almost every one of these viruses we'll see will only have their outbreak after the characters arrive on each world, despite how little that makes sense. But hey, a worldwide dangerous virus outbreak in future Earth 2020? Surprisingly good prediction there, Marvel. The Martians decide that their food supply is too tainted to bother with, so they flee the planet, causing Killraven to cry that zombies have saved the Earth little premature there, buddy, considering that now you have a million zombies running around that you have to find a way to stop. Including a mass of zombie babies that come crawling out of the stomachs of the pregnant breeders. Nasty! But you know I love a good zombie baby, so you got me there, Van Linty. Also, is that a JoJo's reference? As Jackie and Howard are about to be overrun, they call out to Eren, which makes him feel wanted, finally giving him a reason to live. Um... Sure. And he attaches himself to one of the Martian tripods, although now it's more like a quadripod, I guess? In order to rescue them and move us on to our next universe. In this universe, they find the Raimi zombie, cause I guess deadites are close enough to zombies for it to count. And the story will in general pay homage to what is still my favorite Sam Raimi movie, Army of Darkness. And yes, I'm including all three Spider-Mans in that. But I guess that also kind of makes this like, Marvel Zombies vs. Army of Darkness 2? Here we find Sir Percy the Pure, one of King Arthur's Knights of the Round Table, being tricked into opening the Book of the Darkhold, our stand-in for the Necronomicon Ex Mortis. And opening it, of course, causes an army of the undead to rise and begin besieging a nearby castle. Jackie, Howard, and Aaron crash into the castle, causing Aaron to lose his Martian ride. He demands the local blacksmith help him to build new limbs, probably hoping he can get a groovy metal hand out of the deal, but the local lord isn't willing to spare the metal. So instead, Jackie uses her Quicksilver powers, for the first time using them to run really fast, instead of just shoot really fast, and she is quickly able to trace down the root of the infection. She then simply stabs the book with Percy's own sword, and that brings a quick and immediate end to the zombie outbreak. That's really the end of the entire plot of this issue. The next world is a cyberpunk world, but more than that, it's actually a world seen in an earlier Machine Man comic that was set in the future world of 2020. Oh, here we are in 2020 again. Yay. Yay. 
We start with Amadeus Cho, a character that would replace Bruce Banner as the new Hulk not too long after this in the normal universe. But here in this universe, he goes all Matrix as he surfs through cyberspace, looking to download season 7 of the latest show being released by a company called Bane Stark. Cho manages his way through security and grabs the file, but when he shares it with his girlfriend, suddenly they devour each other. And not in a fun sexy way, in like an icky zombie way. Nasty. Yes, it seems the virus was intentionally spread in this universe, as we'll learn once we join back up with our heroes, who once again are on a planet before the actual outbreak. It doesn't take Stack long to realize there's a Jocasta in this universe as well, and he immediately runs off to see her. Well, he does once he uses this world's technology to build himself new limbs. This Jocasta then, quite conveniently, explains the entire plot to us. This is a world where humans have implanted themselves with tech in order to affect their experience of the world, including allowing them to connect to the internet directly from their brains. This Jocasta has grown tired of humanity, and seeing this tech as humans admitting that robot kind was better, she used algorithms to create the perfect TV show, with all the right twists and turns to get all of humanity hooked. Until they absolutely needed to know what happens next. And then she locked that season 7 behind a weak firewall and waited for someone to do the inevitable, allowing her to maintain distance from the infection. And that might still have been fine if Cho hadn't also shared the file for free with everyone, instantly spreading the infection across the world. Howard and Jackie, meanwhile, without any way of knowing what's going on since Aaron ran off, try to do their own research, which unfortunately for Jackie involves her getting some tech of her own. Howard accuses her of wanting to do this only because she's hoping it'll get Machine Man to take notice of her, because I guess she's attracted to him now? Even though there's been zero indication that this is the case leading up to this? And he's strangely attracted to her as well, I guess? Considering his reaction to seeing her change into her Matrix getup for this issue. Considering how much he seems to dislike fleshy ones, as he calls us, this seems like a really out there character change for him, but okay. Speaking of Eren, he's appalled at what this Earth Jocasta has done, especially with her having already zombified the CEO of the mega corporation Bane Stark. A person the original Machine Man in the original story had assigned this Jocasta to watch to keep her from stepping out of line. And she's also converted the other half of that corporation name, this world's Iron Man, Arno Stark. Yep, it's in Arno Stark again, just like in the first issue. We've come all the way back around. This guy existed first, though, since he was part of that old Machine Man story. Machine Man fights off off-brand Iron Man, discovering that the machine armor literally ate the human inside. Super gross. Aaron ends up back with Howard and Jackie just in time to see that Jackie has already been taken over by the zombie virus thanks to her new implant. Machine Man simply rips the implant out, which is apparently enough to save her life, and then guns down Jocasta, realizing she's the controller of the zombie virus. Not sure if that saves everyone or really does anything at all, because the issue ends right there and we won't see this Earth again, but it's whatever. I guess it's really just supposed to be heavy-handed symbolism that Eren is finally over Jocasta and moving on to caring more about Jackie. So, yay, I guess? Yay. No, no, stop that. That did not deserve a chair section. The final issue of the series finds the adventurers on an Earth just like ours. In fact, while it's not directly stated in the issue, it probably is supposed to literally be our Earth. Everyone is described as being completely normal, though they're surprisingly unmoved by the appearance of a walking talking duck despite not even being at a place like Venice Beach, and the Earth is given the designation Earth 0000. They're here looking for a Jackson, which I'm guessing is a reference to the Peter Jackson movie Dead Alive, or Brain Dead as it was originally called, though I've never seen it and I probably never will, so I got nothing. The story focuses on this guy, Wendell, who is... I guess you could say, a comic book fan. Though according to the comic shop guy, he only seems to hate all the comics he buys. Like this issue of Marvel Zombies 5 that he picks up. Although, he is right, Kirkman and Phillips were better at this. I know this is probably just intended as a silly little meta joke, and I shouldn't make a big deal about it, but this bit actually really super bothers me. Because the joke doesn't feel like it's Van Linty making fun of himself, which is what the joke should be. Instead, it feels like the joke is making fun of the fans who read his comics and then dislike them. 
He's essentially blaming the reader for not liking his work, instead of accepting that maybe he just sucks at this? Cause he definitely sucks at this. Who else is to blame, exactly, for the drop in quality that the series has suffered? I would accept as an answer the writer, the artist, the editors, the management team at Marvel, the CEO, or even the stockholders, but it really shouldn't be considered the reader's fault that they want to like a series they once liked but has been ruined by endless subpar stories beating it into the ground. Maybe, FBL, you really are the problem. Maybe you should poke fun at yourself instead of hating on the fans. Just saying. Anyway, as part of being a super comic book nerd, Wendell is also a collector of rare issues when he can get them, which in this case is issue 151 of Marvel Team Up, a non-existent issue of the classic series that supposedly had Machine Man and Howard the Duck teaming up just like in this comic. There's another nice little HT Duck history joke here with the art being done by Frank Brunner, one of the earliest Howard artists, even having done the art for the first two issues of Howard's first solo series. And he actually did the art for at least this page as well, making this an extra cool little nod. When Wendell opened the box for the comic though, a weird dust came out of it, and the dust seems to have made him sick and eventually zombifies him. Wendell freaks out immediately, cause as a nerd he knows what's going on, and thinks of all the different horrible things he might do now that he's a zombie. He even almost eats his bird, Lockheed, which is a cool name for a bird, but thankfully they don't put us through that. That would have been pretty unforgivable. Eventually, he decides his best course is to end the infection with himself before he can spread it to anyone else. But when he hears what he thinks is a woman screaming in terror outside, he changes course, deciding instead that his undead status could help him live out his dreams and be an actual superhero. Only, he freezes up due to rigor mortis. This is when our three heroes show up, collect their final zombie sample, and burn Wendell away. Jackie asks why Wendell was dressed so funny, and this prompts Howard into a philosophical meta-commentary about how hairless apes don't let facts get in the way of telling a good story. Which, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that's accurate. Like, at all. I think the best stories probably rely pretty heavily on facts. But then, maybe that explains so much about Van Linty. That's where the story ends, with no resolution of whether they get to successfully complete the zombie cure or not or even if they get home. But I guess if it doesn't matter to them, then it doesn't matter to me, because we have to get to the breakdown. By the time this comic came around, with having read Marvel Zombies 3, 4, and Return, I was so completely done with Fred Van Linty. So maybe that's why this series was a relatively nice surprise? Or maybe it's just because Howard the Duck is here, providing a significantly less spastic meta-commentary on the series than Zombie Deadpool had, and that made it easier for me, personally, to enjoy. As the world's biggest Howard the Duck fan. That's actually probably not true, but also besides the point. I've enumerated my issues with Van Linty's writing throughout the past two videos in the rest of this review already, but I guess I can sum it up by saying that it seems like he treated Marvel Zombies as more of a comedy or a parody than a horror story. Like he understood how ridiculous the concept was and decided to run all the way in that direction. Which is weird, both in the fact that they gave the guy who couldn't respect the concept the helm on the series, and also that this would come from a fellow Howard the Duck fan. Howard was all about taking ridiculous concepts and playing it weirdly seriously, to the point that the absurdity of how serious it was fed back into the comedy. That's certainly how I feel Kirkman approached the concept for the first two Marvel Zombies series, and I think that's why they worked when they really, really shouldn't have. He didn't dismiss the ridiculousness, but he took the story seriously anyway. Van Linty seems incapable of doing that, and that I feel is the real downfall of what probably could have otherwise worked in this story. Despite that, maybe just because his other Marvel Zombies set such a low bar, I think I'm going to be a little bit generous here and give this series a recommendation level of medium. It's definitely the most easy to read and fun to be had out of all of the Van Linty led Marvel Zombies titles, and I guess that should count for something. The collected edition gets 1. Amazing Spider Pillow, which 
despite its name, is actually fairly middle of the road. You've got the five issues, a short bonus cover gallery, and several pages of bonus black and white pencil art from some of the pages throughout the series. Just as with the story itself, it's not the worst we get from the series, but not mind-blowing either. Thanks everybody for watching and I hope you enjoyed this video. I do want to point out that as much as I hate on Fred Van Linty in these reviews, I don't mean anything personal against him. I've watched some interviews with him and he seems like an alright guy, so please keep in mind that I'm not trying to blame any one person or persons for the failure of any comic, even if I do take some ire out on someone individually. Mostly I'm actually just here to have fun and celebrate the comics that I love even when they disappoint. So if you're down for that, or you enjoyed this video, or you just like the information I provide, then be sure to leave a comment and like and subscribe and all the YouTube stuff so you can help out the channel and so you can make sure to be here next time and I hope to see you then, right here in the Comic Cave.